How's it going, everyone? We are back with another conversation. Myself, Tyler Green, and Mr. Simpa Carter. How are you doing, Simpa? Yo, I am pretty good today. Pretty good. I'm looking awesome. forward to another chat. Yeah, me too. We always have such a good conversation. In fact, guys, in the run up to this, we've already been talking for about half an hour, uh, <laughs> which we always do. We have really nice, long conversations where we get a lot talked about. And that is part of the reason for us wanting to put this series together. Um, so this episode is the second episode in the series. If you missed the first episode, which was the broad history of the last five years in the cannabis campaign in the United Kingdom, then go and check it out. You can find that on YouTube right now. Today, we're going to talk more in depth about medical cannabis and particularly the UK's relationship with medical cannabis, although we'll start off a bit broader and we'll talk about the many benefits of cannabis as well. Uh, this is something that you've talked about in detail for a number of years, Simpa. When did you first come across the medical benefits of cannabis yourself? Um, I suppose as a, as a teenager, really, I, I'd noticed the difference between the nights I went out drinking and smoking together and the nights when I just went out drinking. Um, sort of the, the way that I would feel afterwards and then sort of the morning sessions of having a smoke and being like, wait a minute, my hangover's gone. I don't feel as groggy. I can eat again. I feel like I can face the world. The light isn't giving me the most blinding headache imaginable, you know? And then sort of from there, yeah, just sort of learning that actually, ooh, if I have you know, a good bucket or a good lung, as it were, back in the day when I was a teenager, <laughs> up at about 10, 11 o'clock, I will sleep like a baby. You know what I mean? And it was not really noticing the therapeutic benefits, just more ways that I could use it that amplified and improved my life. And it wasn't really until I got more, I uh, suppose, acutely involved in the sort of academic research and the, the passion kind of rolled over into more around the study of cannabis and understanding it that I really started to understand the depth to which this plant can help supplement our, our endocannabinoid system and thus regulate basically every minor functional system within the body. It's such an incredible moment when you first learn about the ECS, right? Because it's not something that I learned about in school. It's something that I came across one day at the start of my cannabis journey when I was looking at it online and I realized and I learned about this whole system that we only truly figured out in the 1990s, which regulates the body um, with uh, mood, appetite, energy levels, and a lot more deeply than that. What you're saying is completely right. Uh, and, and it was just like a, a groundbreaking moment that, that there's this reason that cannabis is so effective in so many ways for so many people. It's because the cannabinoids that it produces mimic the endocannabinoids that our own body makes to regulate itself, right? The anandamide, the two AGs, um, and the other cannabinoids have their own counterpart endocannabinoids. I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of medical cannabis because it goes back a really long time. And you probably know most of this already, Simpa, but just for the benefit of the viewers watching. Um, I was doing a little bit of research in the run up to this episode, and there are actually over 6,000 years of documented cannabis use in cultural practices, medical applications, um, and breeding practices to enhance the properties of the cannabis plant, which is really cool stuff, um, as well as various methods throughout history that people have consumed it. And it goes all the way back, it probably goes back much further than this, but the first documented medical use goes back to ancient China. Uh, where they've got it da dated to the village of Pan Paho in 4000 BC. The history of medical cannabis published in 2016 in Canada states that at the time it was regarded amongst the five grains, it was known as a major food crop in addition to the production of textiles, rope, paper and oil traditions that have continued to this day. Um, and yeah, the world's oldest pharmacopoeia mentions it. One thing I want to mention is it made its way from ancient China to ancient India, which is really cool stuff because that's where we kind of get our introduction to it. Cannabis evolved in its earliest instance or the earliest ancestor of the cannabis family, which includes things like hops. Um, and eventually, actually, you know, among enough branches, foods like broccoli and uh, Brussels sprouts. But if you go back far enough, they've traced it through fossil records. I think it's about 28 million years ago to the Tibetan plateau. Mm -hmm. And they theorized that the high THC and the cannabinoids in it are protectant uh, from high UV up at altitude. So the, the theory goes is that the plant then sort of evolved and became 
um, sort of stabilized to its environment. And then through just breeding of just the wind and everything else, tra- changing the genetics and at each altitude, the evolution would change. Just the genes and the genes and the expression of the plant would change, yet it would still need the cannabinoids and the uh, terpenes and whatnot as protectants for the structure of the actual plant itself. And so then at some point, humans have interacted with it. We discovered it probably mostly firstly as a food source, yeah. and then it'll have been through decarboxylation of leaving it in the sun that we'll have discovered actually if we then eat it when it's THC rather than THCA, long before we had this knowledge of this, there would be different effects. And then at the time, obviously, we were smoking, drinking into teas and using nature as medicine. We didn't have the, the modern pharmacopoeia you had today. You had different leaves, plants, and flora that you would interact with. Um, and then from that, obviously, the idea of them with textiles because of its, its, its tes- tes- tensile strength yep. um, and because of its, its use in, in terms of building materials and everything else that we do have some evidence for historically, it then just spread around because it's such an adaptive crop. It can acclimatize to most regions incredibly fast. It grows incredibly quick, quickly. It requires a lot less water than most um, uh, native species in most regions. And so then obviously as humans started moving around the world, we just basically started taking it with us, it would seem. The idea of the Silk Road goes back even further than the ideals of the first Silk Road, in my opinion. If you look at the, the work of Graham Hancock and people like that, human history and evolution goes far further back than we, we imagine it to be. We build on top of things. Don't we yeah. build on yeah. what was there and, and improve it? And then that becomes and, the original. Yeah, and we're fi- finding that. So you're finding in tombs, you're finding in ceremonial chambers, evidence of consumption of cannabis and other entheogenic um, plants. And I think that we're really on the cusp of understanding, um, oh, I've almost gone full circle to back to understanding that nature is the, is the original medicine cabinet. Mm. For all we've gone through this scientific study and the extraction and purification of certain compounds, we've now arrived at a point where modern medicine only treats symptomology. It doesn't deal with the underlying causes, whereas the people that are now taking cannabis, I mean, there's a study released in the UK recently, says so like 46% of people were using significantly less pharmaceutical substances when they're taking uh, so-called quest, uh, air quotes medical cannabis. So it just, it shows that the people are getting not just the relief of the single symptoms, they are getting the, the whole spectrum benefit, as it were. They're sleeping better, they're eating better, you know, they're regulating their, their diet, their emotions, their mood and everything far better than they would be on substances that have often uh, A4 pages worth of, of side effects. And could we speculate that the history of cannabis goes even back further into well into prehistory with human um, use and consumption? Because when you look in nature, animals tend to use um, plants that with these healing properties as well, right? There are documented uses of like goats and cows eating cannabis, uh, but also other plants that either get them high or, or serve some sort of medical function. So it is possible that humans and even pre humans beings like neanderthals could have interacted with the cannabis plant and and understood the benefits of it we just can't go back that far with documented evidence so we have to survive with uh, or we have to use um like you say like graves and and remains that they find but pretty much as far back as as you look with human shamanic shamanic remains you tend to find concoctions mm-hmm. that include things like cannabis don't you so it's been a it's been a part of religious uh, ceremonies for a, for a very long time. It's been a part of uh, medical use. Um, and like you say, now we're going around in a full circle and we're starting to realize that you can heal yourself with this plant. And many of us have known this for a long time, but you can heal yourself with this plant in a way that modern medicine isn't dealing with, with the root causes. Um, mm-hmm. So Dr. Um, Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, the Irish physician, back in the Victorian times is known as uh, the introducer of medical cannabis to the West, particularly England. It was on some sort of royal thing. I don't think it was sort of directly working for, but I believe a lot of the um, expeditions as they were at the time were subsidized by the crown. So if you went out there with a certain profession, you went to study the native species. And I literally mean that in the sense of the people and shit, it was that draconian. Um, but, But from that came a lot of, I suppose, great discovery. Yeah. And his medical research, uh, Dr. O'Shaughnessy's medical research led to the development of intravenous therapy. So injecting people with things, but he also introduced the therapeutic use of cannabis to Western medicine. 
um, picking up his knowledge in India, where he would have undoubtedly noticed that the local medical professionals were treating a, a variety of conditions with it and taken that knowledge and become famous for it, like happens in the West. Um, he also validated folks' use of cannabis in India, um, discovered new applications himself, and ultimately recommended it for a, a huge variety of therapeutic purposes. Now, I've in my research, I've actually come across like Victorian era um, documents that basically showed me and told me that uh, that they were using tinctures and cannabis extracts like 130 years ago and they had differences in quality so they had ones that were produced like in London and then Dr O'Shaughnessy would have his ones produced in India and the, the ones produced in India were much higher potency and they would they would prescribe it to every for, for everything they were just experimenting at the time because they realized that it didn't have these longer term side effects that would wear yeah. off and people weren't getting dangerously ill from it it was it was just simply something you could use and it would wear off after with the history of that is quite interesting actually because we classify cannabis i suppose it's again rather contentious at the minute i think we generally accept a consensus of three classifications within the subgenus of cannabis so of cannabis sativa l there is cannabis sativa cannabis indica cannabis ruderalis mm -hmm. i i argue for a subcategorization of cannabis hemp um which would be an artificial collection rather than a genetic collection but that's my own politics anyway the indica and sativa is kind of it's, it's a botanical misclassification as well and i think it's important to point out that everything that we consume is cannabis sativa cannabis sativa l botanically cannabis indica classif classification came from uh two different people discovering it at different times and classifying it as different things and it got really muddled um, and then for a long time even when i came into the cannabis industry we would say oh indica makes you more sleepy and relaxed and sativa makes you more perked up and hyper when actually it's much more driven by terpenes and the that you can get in indicas that really mash you up in a way that you might expect a sativa to traditionally and vice versa so it's nowhere near as clear cut as that traditional it's, yeah classification. It, it, in indica sativa are useful for growers not consumers yeah. an indica sativa classification will not tell you about the effects of it the profile of it will and that knowledge is being pushed more obviously we're then moving away from strains to cultivars but as yeah. we're moving fast to cultivars the medical cannabis chemo industrial vars. complex wants us to move to chemo vars yeah. because I've, you see it, you see, you crack three seeds from the same batch, even from the same plant, you get three different expressions of plant. Mm -hmm. There is such diversity within the genetic expression of these plants that you cannot standardize this. It does not fit into the paradigm of modern pharmacopoeia. This is why I believe that medical cannabis under the current context is going to fail because it, it, doesn't understand the plant or its nuanced connection to the human endocannabinoid system. Wow, that's that's quite a um, that's quite a bomb to drop. What does that <laughs> what does that look like in uh, a failed like if the current medical system fails? Do you mean that they're going to have to at some point like tear up the book and this be like right patients were right like we have to go back to the drawing board and start prescribing herbal because it's, it's there's, there's a lot of money like sadly the way the world works is financially right and it's financially driven and there's a lot of money in isolated cannabinoid compounds being the answer versus yep. a lot less money in um whole plant medicine that anyone can grow themselves right so so i it, it will it may be the best solution but how do we achieve that under capitalism? Well, it's, we're seeing a failure of all systems. We're seeing things collapse massively. I mean, one of the reasons that cannabis works so well is the, its supplementation of the endocannabinoid system, which regulates, among other things, your immune system. Hmm. Without a functional, healthy endocannabinoid system, you can't have an immune system. We want to talk about dealing with this pandemic, with future pandemics, with with all of the other illnesses that pervade our society, heart disease, uh, diabetes, these are all dietary related conditions. If we were to reintroduce cannabis back into our diet, if we then fortified grains and cereals with non-psychoactive cannabinoids, yep. like we do with vitamins currently, the health of the country would shoot the fuck up. But as a Goldman Sachs executive said to a room full of, uh, of investment bankers when they were talking about healthcare investment in America, cures are not conducive for a healthy economy. Mm they're going to continue to roll this out and they're having their successes and their failures and the people that want to uh 
to buy from that paradigm and engage in it will. But a majority of people that have come from this and broken the law and stood stood fast and grown their own, had access to communities, to cooperative growers, to, to clubs, to whatever structure and organization that may be in their various regions, they're then seeing the quality of and the, the consistency of these products and the cost of them and then go, what, what the hell are we doing here? All I'm paying for here is protection. It's a, it's a racketeering scam. All I'm doing is paying for, to be legally protected so that if the cops pull me over, ah, my, my, piece definition. Of, my piece of paper says I'm safe. Yeah, it is. It is. When you actually really look at it. And then, but the other side of it is, the more they push their narrative in order to advertise and market this, they have to speak at least half truths. And within half truths, what is true for air quotes, medical cannabis is true for cannabis. Mm -hmm. The therapeutic benefits of the plant do not give a shit if yeah. it is grown in a greenhouse with a license or in somebody's back garden. That yeah. plant is going to express itself in the same way and is going to have the same potential therapeutic value. The only difference is empowering somebody and giving them the autonomy of their health and giving them a seed rather than a pill and tell them to go home and look after and nurture this thing it means every day they've got to care for it and tend to it. Having that routine, having that, uh, that, that engagement with that plant, watching it grow, nurturing it, caring for it, loving it, then cutting it, curing it, and then getting healthy from it. That relationship is so therapeutic and it is lost under the modern paradigm. That doctor doesn't give a shit. He only learned about the endocannabinoid system last year and he only did it so he can prescribe them and get a hundred quick kickback from everyone he does or whatever the cost may be. And obviously that's, yeah, me being a bit cynical. There are decent apples in that bunch. I'm not saying there aren't. But under the current paradigm, they're deliberately misrepresenting the truth. They're saying only our stuff is medical. The other stuff is dangerous. This, this, I mean, the stuff about the doctors aside, I personally think doctors get into it to heal people and, and therefore they, they're fundamentally good people for the most part, um, with some very notable exceptions from the UK, notoriously. Uh, for some reason, Harold Shipman yeah, jumped right Me in my too. brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Pulled it out of my mouth. Um, but the... Um, the 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 paradox the, it, this is what i call the great con right is how the wall is pulled over the public's eyes in this way which is that by making it medical by a certain company growing it it's it's a different thing to if joe bloggs has grown it himself like a patient has grown it for themselves and the, that does not stack up with the reality because in my experience and talking to some of the best growers and breeders in the uk the best quality cannabis and the best quality medicine, therefore, comes from small garden bespoke boutique grows. As soon as you add warehousing into it, you lose a sense of um, quality that it's very difficult to obtain because to get it perfect is a loving, caring relationship. And you can be the best company with the, the tightest quality control regulations and you'll still have allowances for things that are allowed to go wrong, like per parts per million and things. Whereas people growing it themselves have complete autonomy and ownership over their medicine and can go from what what strains, cultivars, chemovars, however you want to want to name it, are suiting them. And within three, four months can have their own self-sufficient supply of something that's that's not costing them money from from that point. And this is the great con is that we're told that no, that's not medical cannabis, that's street cannabis. And in fact, if you get raided, like one of our friends in the industry uh, has done at the start of this year, um, that will be classed as a class B substance, but not the medicine that it so clearly is, right? Um, so we're in a system where we've got one rule for people that have prescriptions, but really one rule for companies that have, have got the licenses and one rule for everyone else. and and people need to wake up and see that that street cannabis can be better quality than medical cannabis if you want to use the strict definition of street cannabis in the UK as the authorities do because I know medical patients that have got moldy products got got wild variations in the cannabinoid content in their product we're talking nine percent from batch to batch THC variation yeah. so you're using cannabis for epilepsy you're trying to standardize your dose and your what first dose is 16 percent and you say, and, and then you get your next batch of meds, you might, might not have read it, you might not have read the sticker, I don't read the sticker on my asthma pump every time I get it. Yeah, and it's 25%. Consistent. Right? Like, what's the, what are you paying for? It's a great con, I think, on, on the public. And it starts with uh, 2018. I still think this was a good thing that the laws were relaxed slightly to allow private doctors to prescribe it. But the way that it was done, by Sajid Javid, who's now a health secretary. Um, is he? 
Yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. His dad's health secretary was to create a separate thing within a thing to create cannabis based medicinal products for use in humans and say that they're schedule two and cannabis remains schedule one. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any sense. But it's a bit, yeah, it's a little bit more kind of nuanced than that. I mean, as the sort of campaign started, originally they offered licenses, exemptions. So they were saying, all right, yeah, cannabis is still a dangerous drug with no accepted medical value, but under uh, is it the Shulgin Agreement? I can't remember which Shenzhen. agreement it was. Shen Shenzhen? Shenzhen. Shenzhen. Oh, yeah. Um, agreement meant that you can, as long as you've got a prescription filled, it will be honoured by any European Union pharmacy. The Unless issue was around... Right, sorry. No, na na now it's British because we've withdrawn. So now it, it doesn't accept, they don't accept it, which is what's going on with the Bedrolite uh, issue. So what they've done is they made a six month window, then now a 12 month window. So that runs out January, 2021. And they'll probably extend that again for a few more months because they're trying to create obviously new licensing. So this, this all started with basically, I think it was Hannah Deacon was one of the first people with her son, Alfie, yeah. and they got the exemption of the license. And then they were originally going, okay, the license means you can get it through NHS. And they immediately went, whoa, if there's how many people going to need this, we can't afford that. It'll cripple the system. So they immediately put the, pulled the reins back. Then there was a big campaign, obviously, with Charlotte Caldwell and her son, Billy, yeah. um, throughout the UK. That was then uh, sort of at the same time with the United Patients Alliance as well, obviously, were pushing. And yeah, that, that built to this fervor of that, that summer of real activity. I mean, it's, I suppose it started with the EPA first protest. Was that in February? uh it were well, the patients at parliament yeah you're yeah. good memory there mate 11 if i feel like it was the 11th of february 2000 is it 17 18 or 18 18 i think it was the start of 2018 and then we yeah. were there again in november. june maybe uh, and then november they did one in they definitely did one in november as well it was quite frequent we were going to parliament quite often weren't we there was like three mm. or four at least within a short period of time you had Paul Flynn outside, um, like making the case for it for a tea party at one point, and and basically that was that was brilliant awareness day, I think. Yeah, I mean that that worked well. It was a bit, it left a bit of a sour taste in the mouth of I think some of the uh, so-called recreational scene, the people who don't self-identify as medical or people like myself that kind of get therapeutic benefit from cannabis but don't want to empower uh, a corporate monolith taking over what should be a grassroots industry hmm. and so they went in with this idea of yeah we're going to fight for grow your own we're going to fight for the patient's right to access and then they kind of came out with this new classification as as you've rightly pointed out the difference is though it's not under the original murder misuse of drugs act 1971 under the 2001 legislation, they created the 2001 Misuse of Drugs Regulations. Yeah. They did this to allow um, the product Sativex to be sold via, uh, via GW Pharmaceuticals. Because up to that point, the product that they'd then been researching under the research license, they couldn't then bring to market and sell. When they were at that point, they had to change the law in order for them to secure sales legally. In that, they then created Schedule 2 Medical Cannabis which is basically hyphenated as a compound word. So it's not the medical benefits of cannabis. It means the definition which they've ascribed, which you said before, uh, which is a cannabis-based medic uh, cannabis product for medicinal use in humans. Yeah, CBPMs. But and in that the time, this is overlapping with a time that they were copying and pasting a response to every petition that we signed and put up saying that cannabis has no medical benefits in its herbal form. But they put no accepted. So that was the difference. It was the word accepted. So again, the, all governments are incredibly smart with language. They use legalese as a form of protection. And this is what medical cannabis is. This is why I was always air quoted or put it in commas whenever I write about it. Because I, I don't mean what most people hear when they yeah. go, oh, I, I smoke cannabis and get a benefit. Therefore, this is medical cannabis. It's because even the stuff that they're prescribing, under, third line down under that legislation says that the smoking of cannabis is prohibited. Mm -hmm. So it nullifies that schedule two status, puts okay. you back to schedule one. So you can pay all that money, yeah. have that piece of paper. And if you smoke that, yeah. you will so still be treated as a yeah. schedule one class B criminal. Yeah, that's yeah. mental. And I know a lot of patients, I know, I know at least some patients do smoke it because that's the way that they get their, they get their benefit, you know, and we're not saying that that's the best way to consume your cannabis, but it's a way that's been tried and tested for thousands of years and works very effectively for a lot of people. So, uh, and one of the easiest things to do is to roll a joint or to, to hit a bowl or a pipe, especially if you've got medical 
conditions and you're vaporized out of battery, right? Like you can't just yeah. suddenly be a criminal because your mighty's run out of battery or more. You can't afford to spend hundreds of pounds on a vaporizer because you're already spending all your all your money on your medical cannabis because it's not on the mm. NHS. But it's a ridiculous system because then if the promoted harm reduction, then okay, you can you can combust it, but you shouldn't smoke it with tobacco because cannabis is a bronchial dilator. It's actually a protectant of the lining of the lungs. There's a lot of research that's starting to come out that goes, wait a minute, if consuming a burnt carcin a burnt carbonous material causes cancer, where the hell are the lung cancer? Yeah, yeah, patients, yeah. Patients for cannabis. And yeah. what they're finding is, yeah, there are minor protectants within the cannabinoids themselves that are anti-carcinogenic. Yeah. They are protecting in and of themselves. So there is this, this paradigm going on there that it's it's self-protecting. So if we yeah. were then talking about harm reduction uh, for, for people and actually getting them more information education, they can make more informed choices. But they don't want to make you to make informed choices. They don't want you to know there are thousands upon thousands of strains, that, uh, sorry, cultivars. And within those cultivars, you grow one, you hermaphrodize it, it self-pollinates, you'll get thousand plus seeds. You'll have a thousand different type chemo bars, individual profiles of that plant. And then from there, they'll express different, express different. It's unstandizable. She doesn't yeah. fit into the modern paradigm. And this is why they're moving now to look cannibal. Uh, an Israeli based vaporization company took basically a standard uh, Chinese VIP model module that they created a patented cartridge system that's untamperable. Um, I have to vape. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're releasing a one milligram cart that then they say is the best way to release this. Their formulated product with the carrier oil, they've put it in increases bioavailability and it's bollocks. And you then look at what's happened with the misstandard, the misrepresentation of the standardization in prescription. You look at mold and the, the really varying quality standard. That to me feels partly deliberate because then when they can offer this product and go, well, would you not rather have this? It's cheaper, it's standard, it's blah, blah, blah. And they move them onto that that model and then it's not far from there to go actually the way to standardize this is to put synthetics into that vaporization yeah cart. i mean i've been chatting about this behind the scenes with some people that are high up in the cbd industry and and like it's worrying because of this the the lack of standardization or the, uh, the ability to standardize these products along with the way that our politics goes uh, it looks likely that we'll go down that route because um, if you're getting wild variation and you're getting things like mold and stuff, you wouldn't get that with these synthesized isolated compounds. They would be able to give you a pill that gives you the same thing every time. And that's kind of what the that's kind of what you were talking about at the start of this chat, the um, the way that medical science is going in that they want to treat the symptoms. But cannabis treats the, the cause, right? It doesn't just treat the symptoms. It goes deeper than that. Um, and we are in danger of losing the entourage effect of losing the benefits of the coll collection of cannabis in its natural form. But we're not quite there yet. And I'm sure that there's plenty of, of campaigning that will go on and will push back that and, and keep her herbal ac cannabis accessible. Because at the end of the day, when you remove people's ability to legally get cannabis, they, they illegally get cannabis. And it's yep. the way it's always been, <laughs> and the way it always will be. So you just drive patients back to sourcing off the free market and have different situation on your hands if you try to well, yeah. control it too heavily but this is why i alluded to before about sort of the failure of the system is they can succeed that way and they can then get the people who would are still going to carry that stigma and that that persecutive ideology of cannabis consumers and go you druggies you wrong you, you you criminals i just can't prove it you're going to do something wrong you're going to steal from me or you're going to do something inappropriate those people will then still benefit from cannabis that they will go entirely down that synthetic route. They will go and it'll be so homogenized and so removed from the culture and the history and the traditions that actually founded the knowledge that give them this industry that, yeah, they'll be happy. But the people who have grown up through this culture, the people that have known about it, and hopefully the people who will be here to protect it in the future generations will inspire others to do their own knowledge, their own research. At the minute, the past 20 years of knowledge has been lost because it's hidden in laboratories. Mm. It's, it's private patented intellectual property. We live on a crux and a certain precipice in history, I guess, that our generation of activists and of advocates and of individuals that are carrying this torch that has been kept alight through the darkest of days, through storms that we can't imagine. We've lived through prohibition, brother, but we have not lived through prohibition. Yeah. I've smoked a half ounce joint leading a thousand people through fucking Swansea, <laughs> chanting at chanting people for the global cannabis march. I could not have done that generations ago. Yeah, I, I do, I do one generation ago. Yeah, I do that entirely because of everybody before me that has sacrificed <laughs> yeah. and has given something up. And the difference is now that 
they've taken the fucking torch. Whereas before they were trying to extinguish the flame. Now they're trying to proclaim, look what we found and rewrite our history. They're trying to gaslight us and astroturf us in, into to, to misrepresenting their ideals and their goals as if they've just figured this thing out, as if it wasn't millions of people before us who have been a prison, whose lives have been lost, who've been denied jobs, who've been denied homes, who've been denied education, who've been denied the freedom to be themselves. I am bold and proud. I, I am lucky enough to be able to do that and walk down a fucking street with a joint like that and, and, and almost have fun with the cops. Do you know what I mean? Others can't. Others live in, in irrational, unbelievable, paranoid fear, not because of the plant induces it, but because that's what prohibition does to them. Oh, Even yeah, if they get the benefit from paranoia, it, they can't, yeah, they can't afford that benefit. And now we're on to another capitalist problem of then a card system of going, here's your exemption. We're at a system of, I hate to draw the analogy, but papers, please. <laughs> Did you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Are you talking about specifically with medical cannabis or are you talking about vaccine passports? Because I feel like... We're oh, no, I'm, we're, that's, a <laughs> that's a very different conversation. I'm, I'm a different no, conversation, but it's still a papers, please type situation that we're going into as well, isn't it? It's the way, is it the way the world is going is the, the link I'm trying to draw here, which is yeah. that you need kind of to be recognized to to play. It used to just be pay to play. If you've got enough money, you can do whatever you want. And now the spotlight is is on that a little bit. So maybe now it's you need to be authorized to play. Mm. And part of that is getting your vaccine passport or your medical cannabis card. And after that point, you probably will be left alone and, and able to do what you want. Um, but it's a, it's a system of accountability and it's something that I raised at the start of this with the card systems is, is data acquisition and collection is ultimately everything generates data. No matter what you do in the digital space, it generates a vast amount of metadata that yeah. if you know how to weaponize and analyze it, you can make a hell of a lot more money than whatever product or service you're providing. Facebook are the perfect model for this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I worry about the longevity of these, these cards because rather than fighting for, everybody's right of, of innocent until proven guilty we're creating a system of everybody but us is guilty you either you either pay in and opt into this system or you are wrong by definition mm. so with, if you're ignorant of not knowing of the system or if you're even ignorant of not knowing that you have therapeutic benefits of cannabis because look i'm not going to argue that all cannabis is medical because of the weaponization of the word medical mm. i will however say that all cannabis has therapeutic value therefore all of it, even the shit is grown stuff at some point will provide some benefit unless it has molds or added uh, pesticides or fertilizers or other compounds or chemicals or derivatives within it that could then become dangerous through volatilization or combustion. Yeah. The product itself is basically going to be benign based to the, to the greatest part. Obviously there are a small percentage of individuals that could have precipitous events of, of mental health interactions, but the evidence is slowly starting to show that that's more precipitous as in they would have had this anyway. And a study came out recently in America of saying suicide idolation amongst 18 to 25 year olds is a, a, study, a dangerous trend. And basically, if you look at the data, I broke this down in an article for last week and weed on the website. And if, if you look at it from an objective observation, rather than somebody looking at it going, cannabis is bad, let's prove it. If you flip the lens, you actually got actually Kids or young people that have a propensity towards depression or anxiety or are struggling with their uh, integration within society, which actually is a measure of their health, not their, their dishealth or their mm. illness, um, that they have a higher propensity to use cannabis. Yeah. And they're then saying that that's causal and it just isn't. It just fucking isn't. And actually no, psychi not. psychiatry in, in places where it's legal and now looking at their mountains of data and going, wait a minute. Yeah. What if cannabis didn't cause this? These people are using cannabis for this. Yeah. Then they've got this mountain of data to go, actually, all of these people with schizophrenia were typically using this. Let's have a look yeah. at this in, in case studies. So again, okay. they're weaponizing historic data for the benefit of the medical cannabis industrial complex rather than sharing it with the world. They're still perpetuating that cannabis causes psychosis mm. while, the, while GW and others are actually now pre preparing trials to use cannabinoids to treat psychosis. Mm. We're in such a fucked up world. I don't know if I sorry. Yeah, I don't sorry, I, there's no this. shock here because I already know that that's. I already yeah. know that that's 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 an outright another bomb dropped for for people watching. But I already know all of this. Like I already know that they they they're opposite 
of what they say publicly is often the case with cannabis and and it's it's a real shame that the wall is pulled over the the public's eyes and you used a great example there simple which is schizophrenia right so so people that suffer with schizophrenia which i think itself is a vastly complex condition so people that are suffering with schizophrenia are I think like 50%, it's a really high percentage of them end up addicted to various substances in their life. It's, and it's, it's probably self treatment, right? You're trying to do something to change your mental state. Many of them go to the most easy, accessible, illegal drug in the UK, which is cannabis. And then that is used to say that that caused their schizophrenia or has been used in the UK in the past. You still see this, um, myths now in 2021 cannabis psychosis yeah. and, and skunk hysteria. Oh no, it's not all cannabis. Now it's just super strong stuff that happens to be molecularly identical to what we're producing yeah. as medicine. But because we've produced it, it's safe. This is the argument you're seeing in various markets in Colorado and Washington. There are actual lobbyists in their Congress trying now to put THC caps on the recreational market. No way. They're trying, really? to, cap, they are trying to cap extracts in, in Washington state at 50%. And I bet that is so they have a distinguishability between the strength of medical cannabis so that patients need to go and get medical. Like medical's the strong stuff. Do you know what I mean? At the moment, there's no distinguishability. It's cheaper mm. and less taxed, but it's still yep. the same product, right? Whereas once they, once they make medical stronger, then it's a better product, much like you have with my, like losing my hair, hair, hair stuff. You can get 5% minoxidil, over the counter, if you pay Belgravia Center a thousand fifteen hundred pound a year, you can get fifteen percent minoxidil. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's different purities, again enabling pay to play and enabling this market for pharmaceuticals to come in and, and yeah. provide something different. That is mental. Yeah, from conversations I've had with people, yeah, that very much seems to be what they're doing. Is that they want to corner the market by pushing the so-called recreational market down. And therefore, anything that's found at high rates, it's not then going to be that the the potency of it's what's dangerous. It's the mm -hmm. lack of controls in its cultivation is what's dangerous. So they're changing their narrative. They've been adapting for a while. They're co-opting the war. So rather than um, sitting down and us having a fucking treaty and us working down, uh, working out surrender or whatever, they've kind of gone is a right but only if you come through us yeah so they've established their systems they've gone oh it's good manufacturing pro pro uh, process uh stamped it soon i'm telling you we're gonna end with british standard you know the bsi institute mm -hmm. you're gonna with that kind of thing with products but they will not put that to a herbal derived product they're only going to put that to synthetic products people mm -hmm. like the david beckham backed venture with uh, cellular goods they came into the market yeah partly for uh, an inflation thing so that the investors can make a chunk of the money back but they're sitting, lose, losing quite a lot, um, as are a lot of the players at the minute. But they're sat there basically to be first dibs yeah. when it goes. when that Because they know that legislation's coming. They know that internationally, the, that's what's going to be recognised. It doesn't medicine. matter if companies is, is, like is, this is, lose is, money because there's, they're, they're in it for the long term, aren't they? Like, look like, at, look at Canada's bit. Canada's top five still haven't made any goddamn money since 2018. Yeah. They're not but projected they to do, make money until 2018. When they yeah. do, there'll be the Amazon, the SpaceX, the Microsoft of this industry. Mm -hmm. They've already kind of got that kind of accolade. Not not that powerful, but they've already got that like everyone knows about them. So yeah. even if they make losses for another five years, in a hundred years, they're gonna control the market. But it's 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 analogous to say, there's a there's a giant river and all of these engineers come along and want to build these hydro dams. And so we could all work together and go down to the bottom and let the stream flow and build this huge fuck off dam and it power everything and we all, all be enriched from it. Whereas these guys are going, ah, and they stop a few hundred yards down and they build their dam. And so a little bit trickles past and then that builds slowly again. Somebody else comes and builds their dam. And so what they're doing is actually impeding the progress that would actually empower them. They're stopping the flow of the industry by trying to get ahead of it and yeah. fucking, what's the name, dig dastardly it. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're trying to cheat their way when actually if they just drove, they're going to win anyway. They're going to fucking win anyway. If, if they just sat there and just went for it, they would, they would win. And this is the thing that they haven't realized because they're so scared of competition. The vertical integration of neoliberalistic capitalism over the past 30 years since Thatcherism or Reaganomics has meant that you don't compete. You buy out. Somebody comes up and goes with their rival product. Buy them. Bring them in house. What do they do? I don't care. Just buy them. And this is just what everybody does. And then you, you massage things so that you control everything from production through to distribution, marketing, mm. everything in-house, because mm. it's the best way to control profits. 
to keep yeah. your shareholders happy. And so that model applied to this cannabis as it is under the medical paradigm won't work. It's like a whack-a-mole. So every time they're pushing it down with legislation, we found a new nuance. We yeah. attack the, the laws that prohibit the recreational side. And then from that, we build the industry up because as we said, there is no real difference in the product itself. Yeah. The, there is something to say the, the placebo effect of usage. There is mm -hmm. few studies done on this, but there's a few around CBD um, that have suggested that some cannabinoids uh, have a placebo effect. Of course but they it's, do. It's, 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 more, it's more in the marketing though. If you're marketed a product to a certain outcome, you're more likely to feel a certain yeah. outcome. The placebo effect is like, a, and the nocebo effect is really interesting. Mm. Like that it works both yeah. ways, but the fact that our body seems to have this ability to, to pull something out of the woodwork when it's convinced that we've had what will cure us is just incredible. And I bet I, I will make my prediction now, they'll find out in 20, 30 years, that's something to do with the endocannabinoid system. It's something to do with like your body produces, your body can probably produce more 2AG if it feels like you've had CBD. It's, it's probably quite a simple explanation, you know, or, or the same with anandamide. Well, yeah, I think like, yeah, other neuro, uh, neuro hormones and chemicals like dopamine, serotonin and stuff, you develop exactly from what we were saying before about that relationship with planting the seed and growing it. Mm. You know, the, the love you feel, the connection that you feel, that is measurable. And that's yeah. long before you, you interact with the product. And again, even just the idea of autonomy, and I had um, a Right to Die campaign on the podcast recently, Tom Curran, and he spoke of when his wife managed to actually get her end of life drugs, she could live again. Hmm. That up to that point, she was so scared of not being able to control her death. But as soon as she had the autonomy of it, the control of it to go that when I choose, I take these and I'm done. That's the same as, as growing that plant, is having that, that there and that availability and having that consistency and continuity of a cultivar that you have found really helps you. Because you basically, you, you, you're shopping around for the best of a handful on the current market, whereas cultivation at home under a setup, you can grow any genetic from anywhere in the world with any profile. You can access databases, forums, and social media accounts and, and testimonies and stories of people that have grown these things for various other conditions. You can get access to that information. It takes a lot of research and a lot of meticulous digging around, especially through shadow banning and various of the restraints and censorship put on by uh, Google and, and other uh, platform providers. But the information is there. So it, it's difficult to empower the people. But that's, I think, the main thing we have to do is not just go, oh, medical is legal. Therefore, eventually they'll fix it for you and they'll have the perfect thing. No, find your nuance now. Yeah. Find your space within this, what works for you, and in some way gain access because everybody can benefit from this plant in so much way. I truly believe that. Even yeah, just supplementing their diet so with this, so it's consuming non-psychoactive cannabinoids. We have to be careful of, of medical appeasement taken away from the urgent need for everyone to, to have access to this. I'd go further than autonomy. I think autonomy is so powerful, like you say, giving that lady uh, her, her right to life again at the end of it is an incredible thing, right? Um, but even in a system where they removed the red tape around cannabis, not only would you have autonomy to grow your own medicine, but you'd be able to set up public open networks where all different chemovars and cultivars were accessible to everyone, right? And everyone would be able, this is the idea of the collectives, right? This is how it all sprung up in the first place. If you and five other patients don't have enough space to grow all these different different chem, uh, chemovars or cultivars, then you can have a collective where you swap medicines or you swap different strains, and then you get the benefit of multiple things for your condition, right? And we know from research that most people aren't going to just get on with one strain for their whole their whole life. Like you want a couple of variations, right? Well, like you you need dependence because you build tolerance. So even to terpenes, to everything, else, the human body is, is so adaptive. It's you've, you've got to keep it guessing. This is what they say in exercise. You almost want to surprise your body. You know what <laughs> I mean? Because it, it's, we are lazy. Every cell in our body is lazy. Not in the sense that we're lethargic and want to just... Blah, blah, blah. The energy efficiency of life, everything is moving towards atrophy and it tries to slow this process through energy conservation. And our, our bodies and our lives are, are the same. So as soon as you put someone in an environment, they figure out shortcuts. They figure out ways to do that job a little easier so they can rest a bit harder. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the same, the same is true of, of, the, of the human body and the way that we interact with, with, with cannabis and whatever. So we, we, we take what we need. 
Do, do you know what I mean? And I still think that it's, it's better for us to over supplement than it is for us to under. So this is another point I wanted to raise with this is the industry trying to standardize dosage and mm. saying that actually you need only 10 mil here, 20 mil here. Yeah, well, have yeah. you taken, have, have you taken, have you, have you, yeah, have you taken into consideration the mass of an individual, their body mass? Have you taken into consideration their metabolism, how active they are? What are the drugs they're taking? Have you considered comorbidity of condition? There are so many other questions that are just not answered because they are just not trained within this. We are in a, a generation of over-specialization and specification within knowledge. Mm. So literally people know so much of their one tiny little thing that they can't see anything else. Mm. They don't, they don't know. So there's, there's physicians that have spent 30, 40 years within their, their realm of knowledge and their study of field, a field of study that don't know how their body part relates to other body parts anymore. They just are not the fuck aware. So if all of these people talking about neurology, physiology, you know, the bone structure, uh, uh, regeneration and growth and cell regeneration and all of this don't know about the endocannabinoid system, they, they're, they're doing their work with both hands tied behind their back. Mm. They are yeah, no, I can, it's, it's you, the over specialized. Yeah, you bring up points that I've just never thought about, but that makes so much sense. And that's why we chat so long because I could just go down that route and chat to you about that for an hour because that is super interesting. <laughs> um, I wanted to sort of hone it back to kind of science, but some of the positives that are coming out of medical. Um, I want to talk about the Project 21 scheme. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about Professor David Nutt, right? Because he's traditionally and quite um awesomely broken from um the government's official line on drugs and not just cannabis all drugs but he's is highly in favor of evidence-based policy so famously in 2007 professor david nutt was sacked from the acmd the advisory council for misuse of drugs which is the government's own panel of scientists that advise it on the dangers of drugs he was sacked for publicly talking about how riding the horse is more dangerous than taking ecstasy. And that just, I, I really started paying attention to him at that point because it was, it was a very um, big thing to say at the time. No one would kind of compare those two things. But what he was doing was he was assessing logically the risks of both of those events and that you're more likely to fall off your horse and have a serious injury than you are to have a bad time, an injury from, from taking ecstasy at the weekend. Then he moved on to cannabis and started talking quite openly. I think I've seen him interview Howard Marks, um, but talking openly about how the policy is wrong um, and, and basically being a brilliant advocate for cannabis legalization. Most recently, um, as part of drug science, which is what he founded when he was sacked from the ACMD, they've launched a scheme called Project 21 which is a campaign that um, eligible patients get access to affordable medical cannabis treatments. So not just get access to cannabis, but it's then subsidized. So it becomes a lot cheaper for them on a monthly basis. And what this is aiming to do is to create the UK's largest body of evidence for the effectiveness and tolerability of medical cannabis to hopefully give the NHS the data it needs to start getting funding to prescribe patients. So I think that's a really good, I think it's a really cool thing and, and a really good thing they're doing. Um, what's your take on Project 21 Simpa? Um, uh, I'll kind of cover what you said and build to that. Uh, yeah, the ecstasy versus equestrian sort of paper was quite quite famous and very interesting and almost <laughs> funny summation. Um, worth, worth a read if people want to go check it out online. And yeah, he, he drew these parallels in such a, again, the overview, almost without irony of, well, here you go. Here's these two activities that people can choose to engage in. One is criminalized, one isn't. What are the potential outcomes of harm? What are the consequences of those harms? He then put them together, put them in that um, paper, presented it, and obviously got a hell of a lot of media attention. He did uh, around that time as well, a reclassification of 20 drugs in the UK at which point he again got a lot of media attention because oh, he, yeah. he, re he reclassified. Yeah, he put like uh, heroin, tobacco, alcohol, uh, cocaine and stuff at this sort of side. Cannabis, LSD, magic mushrooms, way down the other side. Things like uh, cat, kratom um, and ch -ch -ch -ch, uh, other sort of natural antigens. You know, there's, there's a hell of a lot of compounds that he actually so put together. So just for our there. viewers, basically how that if you are going to have a class A, class B and class C system, what should be in class A based on the harms that it presents society? That's the chart that he, he drew up, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Took obviously a lot of heat for that. Um, and then, yeah, it was basically he was sacked. I think the official line was um, for having an opinion contrary to government policy. That although they were an independent body, he couldn't have, um, he couldn't speak his opinion against government policy, which is a bit um sensory if you get what i mean it's a bit yeah. censorship y but it, it, yeah it is what it is i, I respect Brilliant. the direction the direction that he's kind of gone in unfortunately with drug uh with the way drug science project 21 the data that i've seen from labs that have been collecting data on the samples that have been sent out to various patients show wild variations in cannabinoid profiles and terpene profiles as mm -hmm. well as mislabeled products um having conversations as well from people i know in certain supply chains they have basically said that what they're doing is matching profiles. So if they're prescribing a 22 to one, as in 22% THC to 1% CBD, mm -hmm. and they run out from that supplier, say in Israel, they'll bring around Canada, Australia, wherever else, and go, what have you got? Have you got something close to a 22, 1% without considering the terpene profile, without considering the cultivar variation because of the environment it is produced in, not only that, the standards to which it's produced within that region. This is, so, can I just interject and then please go back to your excellent point. This is the what the danger of the way things are going in, in the UK, right? Is is that you're in danger of doing that because you're too focused on the ratio. It's like, yeah. it's a real focus in the UK. Yeah, because they, they've painted themselves into a corner. The lie has been that too high THC is dangerous and therefore you, you can offset that with CBD. But my paranoid little brain suggests that in years to come, we will see that actually CBD reduces the efficacy of THC, not just its psychoactivity. Mm. So I believe that the combination of these compounds is, is a deliberate way to reduce the efficacy of THC for its almost like stem cell like cannabinoid. Effect. I, th I think it is the largest uh, universal key for the locks in the body, as we've seen with the CB1 uh, adaptivity. Well, you, th you, you theorize that THC is not cannabis itself, but literally like Rick Simpson's view, right? That, that, that it's tetrahydrocannabinol that is the I, th I think it's the, I, th I think it's the, yeah, I think it's the stem cell. I think we get massive benefit from minor cannabinoids and from the entourage effect created by minor cannabinoids plus THC and terpenes and mm. terpenes themselves have psychoactive and physiological benefits and effect. Mm. But my theory is that, yeah, the reason we see THC be so powerful and ubiquitously utilized around the world is that it somehow supplements the system to such a degree that it allows the endocannabinoid system and your own internal healing to occur. So mm. cannabis isn't doing the healing. It's about the supplementation of the system. And so but I think, the get, oh, yeah, completely agree with that. Most of what you're saying, but, but CBD, CBD does have its own benefit and effects. But what I mean by that is that then it's, it's how we're going to measure sort of the outcomes of it. And I, I believe that CBD in its taken by itself, yes, has benefits within, yeah, that's what I'm arguing. in the body. Yeah. It was long. Yeah. In terms of anti-inflammatory, and anti-inflammatory, um, support well, you see patients that haven't ha ever had THC now, don't you? So, so you will see people healing themselves purely with CBD cannabis. And it, yeah, it depends I think on it's, what it's, your condition it's, is. Yeah, horses for courses. And I think that it's, I don't particularly share his idea of it, but the idea of crashing the system with THC, I believe that if it's about supplementation of the endocannabinoid system, mm. the more cannabinoids you can get, it's better to supplement to excess because it's the same with vitamins. You take shit ton of vitamins, your body just wastes the rest. You take what you need, you waste the rest. Hmm. And I, I believe the same is then true of cannabis. Yeah, you may have a stone you over you what you have... need and you're not sure. The, the problem is you're not sure what you need. It's a patient by patient basis. That's why when people are treating themselves with for cancers and things, the yeah. idea is to get up to as high a dose as the body can tolerate, right? To with that's, that's kind, of, kind, kind of odd, uh, old hock, I think is the expression. Um, now, there are more dosing coming out of clinics and various metadata studies. So they're, they're accruing the, the data from people that are using it in hour to be prescribed in certain regions for pain. So yeah. what they're doing to get around it in various areas is they prescribe it for, for, cancer, for, for, cancer. for, pain, for pain, but then they still observe what's happening in terms of tumor reduction, et cetera. Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of backdoor research because, again, they can't admit that, that cannabis, especially THC, causes apoptosis in cancer cells. That, yeah, that, 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 admit, that's like that's like proven like that's like that not being a conspiracy theorist like there's documented yeah. evidence of, of well we, like, we, there's various studies of cannabis reducing tumors various various studies not just anecdotal 
Well, you can Google the patent for GW Pharmaceutical from 2010 for using uh, novel cannabinoids um, to cause apoptosis in cancer cells. Mm. They're, they're already fucking on this. The fact that GW was then sold to Jazz Pharmaceuticals, an oncologist, cancer specialist, speaks volumes to where they're going in terms of uh, the future oh. direction of this. We're, we're kind of held back in the UK by the Cancer Act, which basically means it's illegal to kind of discuss or promote other non-accepted um, kind of cancer therapies. Right. So, so it's actually criminal. So that's kind of one of the things that they keep us away from it. Um, there are various people that have kind of stepped away from the, the established uh, medical system and do advocate this privately. There are obviously yeah. a lot of people will ad advocate and speak of not just can uh, cannabis, but various of the homeopathic or sort of dietary and lifestyle changes. It's a combination yeah, of all not, of these things. Yeah, because it's not, it's not just cannabis. That's the answer. And, and without getting this isn't a new age podcast. Like we've got we, we've got varying views, but like we're, we're both science based people. Right. But but there are other treatments that also have a benefit for people with with cancers that aren't discussed in the mainstream as well cannabis is perhaps my well most well known but but it's it seems to be like very driven on your lifestyle and like making some very strict changes and living in a certain way and not introducing things that that are going to aggravate uh yeah. tumors yeah. and things like that but yeah. uh, a good analogy for it is to think of being stood in a house fire and then so you get cancer that's you're on fire in the house of fire you get out of the house and you get you put it out you, you tackle it if you then go back in the house you're gonna be on fire you need to move set up a new house and the house is your life it's it's the way you live it's it's about making your body um uninhabitable for cancerous cells mm. it's if, if, if your body is in such a healthy paradigm that then any mutations or iterations or any exposure to minor carcinogenic products means that your body will be able to tackle them. If your immune system is low, this is mainly when, when cancer mutates. And once it metastasizes and becomes tumors to a certain size, it tricks the body into thinking it's part of the body. It doesn't even know it's sick. Yeah. You can just continue to go through your goddamn life until somebody, you get a scan or whatever, or until you arrive at a point where it starts to derive, uh, deplete other systems and you start to get fucking sick. You know what I mean? Um, so, so that, so you, you can intervene with that a lot fucking earlier, but they're not doing that. They'll yeah. put you through, uh, chemotherapy. They'll put you through all of these other, uh, pharma pharmaceutically approved therapies, but they will not talk to you about your lifestyle. They're not talking to you either. Yeah. They'll still say like, do you smoke tobacco? But yeah. they won't ask you about what foods you consume. Yeah. Do you live a sedentary yeah. lifestyle? Do you live in say inner city London? Do you not mean are you exposed to more pollutants? Are there trees around you? Because it's been separated from the 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 mental health side completely. Like, and, and that's so important for for people that are suffering from a, a, a physical condition, because you you it's how you deal with it, and part of that, and part of your immune system is how strong you are, both mentally and physically, right? Like you can and, yeah. raise your immune and system by and depression. That's a, and that's another thing we're missing with this medical medical cannabis paradigm. Where the hell are the clubs? Where the hell are the spaces? I mean, I applaud what uh, Product Earth have just announced today. Though there'll be a medical zone at this year's Product Earth, which means people with prescriptions will be able to, air quotes, legally consume their product. Mm -hmm. And they'll be able to medicate, you know what I mean? And yeah, I, I, I respect that and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But we're missing then the nuance of the healing of being together with others. Yeah. The, the community aspect that again is there's a placebo effect there. There's a certain sense of, of autonomy, of socialization. We know promote healthy uh, hormonal production in the body we've talked about the the cutting edge of me or the, the medical science that's not quite been fully legitimized yet which is cannabis treating cancer which we have a lot of anecdotal stories and how it helps people doesn't work for everyone but um but it seems to work and we need much more research in this area there are a lot more widely accepted um medical conditions that cannabis has therapeutic actions for what can you be prescribed medical cannabis for in the uk at the moment uh, it depends on who you talk to as to what they'll they'll say with this so technically under the guidelines a specialist of any degree can prescribe um cannabis for anything so it has to come from a specialist not a general practitioner mm -hmm. um it's then very difficult to obviously get a specialist of any degree to to sign on to this what then has happened through the private clinics is basically uh, people from various professions have kind of moved away from where they were working into these private clinics to bring their credentials so that they can then see people through a consultation basis, then go, because I have this 
this specialty, I can then then prescribe this. So, so what great... conditions um, are we talking about? So we're talking like epilepsy is going to be a big one, right? So like people yeah. that are suffering with epilepsy because of what's happened with Billy Caldwell yeah. and Alfred Dingley, one of the most well-known mm -hmm. conditions okay. that are treated. Um, like multiple cirrhosis, another huge one that's kind of widely accepted because yeah. we've got like the MS Society have publicly come out and said it works for patients. Yeah, any anything that has a prescribable already existing cannabis derived uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. So Sativex and Epidiolex mean that, yeah, they have to be able to prescribe a product for epilepsy and for spasticity in MS. Um, Chronic pain, obviously, is, a, is another big one. In fact, that's the vast majority of prescriptions. Yeah. And what but they're is, doing so, is... So is chronic pain, so just, just for the viewers, is that accepted in the UK? So if you're in chronic pain, you can go into a clinic, private clinic, and get prescribed medical cannabis now? Yeah. And so there are, it's supposed to be, you could be prescribed for things, uh, neurological conditions and mental health conditions as well, but they're still quite holding out as to whether they will or not. The clinics will only accept certain cases, but again, in the, as far as my understanding of the law, and I haven't looked at this since it changed, so there may have been, there's, there's been no updates that I've sort of seen, um, but as far as I was uh, I'm aware and believe, anything can be prescribed for it's just as to whether you can get the bureaucracy to actually agree to it each person to sign to sign it and then somebody to fulfill it but we are growing closer every day i mean obviously with the medical cards i think can card i think have narrowed their acceptable conditions for example um so i think it, it's they're now in line with what the clinics will prescribe so i think the clinics basically build their own list Right, and it's, yep. it's, it's just almost what they have a specialist in-house. And all, all that's for is to defend against uh, the Royal College of Physicians uh, and the various medical bodies and groups that make up the medical profession in the UK because there are so many of them at different levels that can all withdraw or put pressure on people to then resign. So then the prescribers don't want to be in a position where they could lose their tenure, they could lose their career and et cetera. Yes, so it will be acceptable by the professionals before it's yeah. done. Basically. So, so, so basically they're, they're slowly. Yeah. They're all being hoity toity in their, their private conferences, trying to figure out and go, well, actually we have got efficacy of this. Well, yeah, we've got a patented product of this. So therefore we can prescribe that. There's now we've had, four or five of the mothers with epileptic children on the podcast and they've all been pushed down the epidiolex route mm. they've basically been told now especially with bedrolite coming to an end with the debacle with the holland uh dispensaries because of brexit they have basically been told yeah you can continue this and what we'll do is we'll push you on to a prescription for epidiolex mm -hmm. so there is potential for future nhs prescriptions yeah they are look looking likely to only be for synthetic or patented products because there are three herbal cannabis prescriptions on the NHS at the moment. We discussed this briefly last week, um, but nowhere near enough. Like there need, there's there's a million and a half medical cannabis patients in the UK. Like where's that? As an as an est as an estimate, yeah, exactly. And it's three versus somewhere in the region of six thousand on private prescription. Yeah. No, so and then you've got to consider the people who've been informed in these three years that are now going well i grow cannabis or i've got access to cannabis this is medicine yeah so that that's probably way more than this one point whatever then you've oh, yeah, got i'm the, not the, considering the, myself in that and i use it yeah. to treat my migraines so yeah exactly the then you day, yeah that's like you then, call me medical if you wanted yeah then you've got us lot that are for this analogy on the fence because we're minor informed you know we know enough to kind of go we're not that out of uh, our own ethics and morality then yeah. you've got the people who just don't have a clue about the benefits of it but consume it and notice that actually when i don't consume it my back hurts more i don't sleep very well or i get a bit argumentative with the wife or whatever other things are occurring in their life mm. once they have that knowledge we have to be there as the gatekeepers to catch them from getting thrown into the medical and going well i'll go from this that dave's grown with love for two, three four years in his bedroom and helped out 10 of us in this area to buy in this israeli canadian imported product that's been irradiated and, and still comes with mold and whatever but the yeah i mean times are changing there's such a huge so there's a growth the last thing i want to talk about in today's conversation actually is that there is a huge medical community growing in the uk and it's something that i've recently uh been introduced to been chatting with someone on instagram that is a medical patient i would ask simply do you know how quickly so say say i'm a medical patient and i've got a, i've got a prescription do you know how easy it is because I've, I've got the answer to this but have you been made aware of how easy it is to get your weed and how fast you can have it 
it depends on the clinic that you uh, are signing up to. In the interim, when it first started, um, I heard that it was quite efficient. They were operating pretty well. There's been production it's efficient, issues. They used to, when I first like heard, when we first heard about it, they were having to go out to Holland, get the prescription in Holland, bring it back to the UK. So it was taking like yeah, four yeah. or five days. Did you know that the that as a patient, so say you've been prescribed and you've got access to one of these portals, you get this guy that I'm chatting to, he basically is coming out at like five pound a gram and he's getting it next day delivery via DPD. So he all, so he orders it before 5 p.m. and he gets it the next day via DPD delivered, which I just think is insane. So, so, so I think it's, it's really, really good that, that some patients have that access. It needs to be everyone. Um, and I don't want to put it down. Like I get that there are issues with it, with, with some batches have had mold, but I like that in that case, the patients have kind of like they're, they're really talking about it and they're putting that back to the companies and back to well, the they're, they're forced force the company into a recall it was not like us like what in, on the free market like what can we do if something's got mold in like all right i might have the privilege of being able to call someone up and being like mate that's not on but if you're buying it on the street you you can't you can't do that so so i do think that that is going for, for the patient community is is getting better but then what we're in danger of is everyone else being left behind unless you get that card unless you get that prescription and then you and then once you get that prescription you feel different to everyone else and you and you lose your um your care for the wider community because you're in the patient community you know so yeah we need Protect to care for everyone in this industry protection breeds apathy we've seen this mentality throughout history that when a certain population are protected and safe that comfortability leaches into their lives. Mm. And I'm not stating this of the majority of the community, but the last thing that I will state on this is that I understand wholeheartedly. I sympathize and empathize with the decisions that have been made and taken by some people, mm. but they have to recognize that unless you are fighting for the others, unless you are turning around and giving a hand up, then you are besmirching, and that is a really archaic term. I don't know where that one came from. And you are you are pissing in the face of every single person that allowed you to get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the medical people, the people that rallied the activists, every mom and pop, every kid, every person that ever interacted with this plant that in some way spoke truth to power that allowed us to get to this precipice in history. And if we don't acknowledge that, respect it, and utilize the technology that we have now to document the history, the stories, and the legacy of the people that got us here, then what, frankly, what the fuck is this all for? So I do hope that anybody listening to this that is sat in that position of comfortability, that you are trying to help others in some way, that you are trying to inform others, that you are pushing that boundary, that you are challenging the stigma, that you are proudly consuming your product. And yeah, you may speak of it as a medicine, but remember, it is still the same plant that I smoke and am criminalized for. It is still the same plant that I have friends that are facing prison for, the, the, the people who have fathers, sons, mothers, brothers that are locked in cages. We have to acknowledge that truth at every turn. Yeah, and we and with legalization sweeping the world, we are in danger of that being brushed under the carpet. And in 20, 30 years, people only seeing the good of it and, and not remembering all of the, the people that were locked up for a very long time for doing what we're able to do, even under prohibition in 2021. Yeah. Um, you know, it has it has really relaxed, and um, yeah, we're built on the shoulders of the the greats that came before us, right? So, so yeah, thank you so much with, to everyone that's that, watched sorry. this episode. Sorry, can I just quickly do one shout out then? It. I'm not going to correct you. I'm oh, just going to say, rest in peace, Frenchie Canoli. We lost a legend today. I can't. Mind. Yeah, this this is something that we found out about today, right? So on, on the day of filming. Uh, yeah, we've, we've lost Frenchie Canoli. Now, I never had the pleasure to, to meet Frenchie, but was uh, a, a follower of his work and, and particularly the, the hash porn contest that he had on Instagram. Um, he really contributed some incredible culture and made hash into an art form. So what you, you've, you've met him um, at least once, haven't you, Simba? Yeah, I've bumped into him sort of a, a few times at various events and, and anywhere I've ever been and everywhere I've ever seen him, um, always had an aura of just just chill and joy. You know, everybody always, he, he had a kind word for everybody, man, always had the un most unbelievable amount of knowledge um, about sort of hash and about cannabis and was just always quite a 
challenge and anything I ever spoke would always challenge sort of opinions on things. And I think that even the small conversations and interactions I had with them sort of um, helped sort of shape and inform my opinion on the plant. Yeah. Oh, we lost a great. So yeah, rest in peace, Frenchie Cannoli. And uh, yeah, everyone will continue that great work that uh that he he's been putting in and the influence that he's, he's put into the campaign so um yeah guys look thank you so much for watching this has been episode two of our conversations tyler green and simple carter we're talking about medical cannabis today um last week we were talking about the the broader last five years in the industry and we'll be back with another subject for next week so as always make sure you hit that thumbs up and subscribe to the channel to help us grow that's it for the moment. Thanks for watching and keep talking. Yeah. <laughs>